Hi, friends. Welcome to another episode of the 10 Laws Podcast with East Forest. I'm East Forest. I'm coming to you from a wintry Boise, Idaho. I've been here sort of getting ready for the tour to Australia in February, finishing up the studio, finishing up the sauna, and having some good podcast conversations. Recently, I got to talk with somebody named Julian Treasure, who's our guest today. And Julian is someone that I ran across, like, you know, you're on your YouTube feed and mine sometimes is filled with stuff about sound and music. And this guy pops up and he's talking about sound and listening and how it affects our lives and our minds. And I'm thinking, this is so in wavelength with myself and what I think. I would love to talk to him. And I looked him up online and saw quickly that he's a very sought after speaker. He's done five TED Talks that have been viewed apparently more than 80 million times. So pretty popular guy on these subjects and he's very well versed on the subject. But thankfully he responded and was interested and we had a little a little call, kind of a pre-call just to sort of, he could probably just get to know me and see if I would be uh, worthy of talking to him. And it was one of these situations where, so he's in the, in Scotland and I'm in the States obviously at the time. And we, we scheduled this several months in advance just to chat on the phone. And it was the day before Thanksgiving here in the States, which I thought, no problem. I think that'll work. And the day came and I was traveling for Thanksgiving. I still thought I'd be okay, but we were at a, um, a hot spring type resort and it was in the mountains of Oregon and a snowstorm ran through and like there's it killed any opportunity of doing like a decent Skype call. So that was a huge bummer. And to Julian's grace, he we rescheduled that call. We did it later, another month or two later. And we did get to talk. And we're like, yes, this would be a good idea. We scheduled the podcast. And so this is it. And I was able to ask a lot of the questions I've been wanting to ask. And I think you'll find this completely fascinating and completely amazing uh, how sound and, and listening and the role it plays in our lives and the stress and it's sort of a scientific angle that, well, it's totally fascinating to me. And I know if you listen to this, it will affect your life. If you get a moment to review this podcast, that would be wonderful, particularly on Apple Podcasts. It's uh, where you can do it for sure. Scroll down there to the bottom on the, the main screen. It has the, the show or the available episodes. You'll figure it out. Hit five stars, give a written review, share this online. All those things make a big difference, and I very much appreciate it. Sconchi 2 left a review. That's right, Sconchi 2. Five stars, keep up the great work, love the podcast and the lessons it holds. Hearing you go over the Ram Dass album was beautiful. Thank you. I needed that. You're welcome, Sconchi too. Appreciate you leaving a review. Um, otherwise, just updates from this front. I have completed the sauna. So the sauna that I've been working on, it took two weeks to the day. I was a complete machine working on that thing. But I got to say, it's amazing. You know, I have the sauna I've spoken about in southern Utah, and having one up here was a real dream and a real abundance. But it's wood fired. You get in there, it's got some different levels of benches, and I got the rocks that I brought up from Boulder, too. Boulder's from Boulder, Utah. And it's been amazing. Really happy about that. But I'm also recognizing that doing construction projects, whether it's that or working on the music studio, is a form of resistance for me, resistance uh, in the parlance of The War of Art, Stephen Pressfield's book, of me resisting, you know, playing music. <laughs> so, but I recognize I'm, I'm, I'm setting the stage and sowing the fields by building music studios and stuff, and it's all good. But that's what I've been up to and just getting ready to go to Australia. So, obviously, there's a lot going on there with the fires, and I'm keeping track of it, and... Um, my heart goes out to everyone that's there, and I'm, I'm just trying to get a lay of the land. But I think the East Forest Ceremony concert that we're going to be offering there, I believe there's about seven or so, seven or eight we're currently scheduled and selling tickets for, can be helpful in the sense that it's a place to really connect with that inner fortitude, wisdom, truth, a, a time to just you know get a breath of air and from everything that's going on. And gather as community, and I think these are all things that are really important. Uh, 
you know, in my opinion, a lot of what's going on in our world and what I think Australia is sort of at the spear tip of right now is stemming from a spiritual emergency in a way, a spiritual issue. And there's nothing wrong with it, but I do think that, you know, the kind of solutions we need are going to begin from the inside out as they turn into collective movements and change that we each make based on our recognition of our connection to one another, not just as people, but as a planet, as a cosmos. So I am going down there as an act of service too, to just do my small part, to offer some space for that kind of connection to our inner self, which in turn creates our connection to all selves, the great self of all. That's often what I feel when I feel more connected. Okay. So let's get into this. This is a wonderful conversation with Julian Treasure. Well, I'm, I'm really excited to talk. I know it's been a bit of a journey for us to get connected, but it was all started when I saw, I think it was on YouTube, and it was not one of your TED Talks. It was just an interview that you did, and you were talking about sound, which is something that you and I are both quite obsessed with in maybe yes. slightly different ways, but there was an amazing amount of crossover, and I immediately thought, oh, I'd love to to talk to you and also ask you some questions because for instance, like let's just get into this. I mean, right now I'm, I'm sitting in a studio that I've been working on building. And when I first got into this space, it was an external garage. It was quite sort of reverberant and mm-hmm. I knew that would be a problem for mixing and doing music. And so I started building sound absorption panels and all sorts of things like that. And I started putting them up and progressively as I put them up, the sound got better and better for making music. But what I discovered when I got them all up is I love being in this space simply because of how it sounds. Like I feel calmer. It's not a dead room, but it's very quiet and the sound doesn't bounce around too much. And it has this lovely sort of atmosphere of sound. And that's something you talk about a lot. And I I think you call it sort of like soundscaping as sort of an active thing you do to design a space. Yes, absolutely. And um, really over the years <clears throat> in the sound agency, which is the main uh, work I do, um, it's an audio branding company, but it, it focuses on sound in spaces. We've mm-hmm. come to the conclusion there are four things you have to get right to get sound in a space um, to be appropriate. And that's a very important word because obviously you do not want a cathedral to sound like a recording studio or vice versa. So the four things to pay attention to are um, acoustics. That's the baseline. It's very difficult to get a good sound in a room with bad acoustics. And also one needs to pay attention to the kind of content or the kind of thing you're going to be doing in there. I mean, you know, the the reason that we have, for example, uh, Gregorian chant and plain song is because those kind of musics Uh, were designed to be performed in spaces with reverberation times of three, five, seven seconds. Right. right. Long, floaty reverb. Um, And they sound beautiful in that. I mean, if you you put somebody singing plain song into a a dead recording studio, it would not sound at all the same. A lot of people put that in their headphones. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. There's a dance between the content and the space. And I think David Byrne did a wonderful TED talk about that and the way that music and the spaces in which it was performed um, really organically evolved together. So, you know, you couldn't have a symphony orchestra playing in your front room, or they wouldn't fit, but I mean, it wouldn't be right. Um, It needs a concert hall. It needs a, a room with acoustics of, you know, one to two second reverberation and certain profile in order to make a, sym- a symphony orchestra sound good. Uh, so there's there's a, a relationship. Acoustics really important. I mean, I've lost count of the number of places I've been into which have got inappropriate acoustics because the cast, um, architects are so obsessed with how things look. 
Now, it's never the case in recording studios because that's a room that's designed for purpose. And it's also the case that, um, for example, concert halls, people pay very close attention to acoustics. When I did a talk <clears throat> a few years ago in the wonderful concert hall in Helsinki, which was um, designed by um, is it Mr. Toyota, I think, uh, who was involved from Arab and who is a genius. And it, it, I mean, that is a huge space and it's configurable. You can rotate panels to change the acoustics depending on whether you're dealing with speech, singing, orchestra, solo instrument, whatever it may be. And it's, it's wonderful. So, you know, if we pay attention to acoustics, we can get it right. But it's rare that that's the case in non-musical spaces like offices, for example, hospitals, schoolrooms. The acoustics are generally lousy. And the result is lots and lots of noise, loss of communication, stress, fatigue, shouting, unhappiness, and so forth. The second uh, thing after acoustics is noise. And obviously in a recording studio, you can't have even, for example, air conditioning making a noise. So people have jumped through hoops designing systems mm -hmm. where you've got baffles and long tubes and loads of padding and stuff to make sure that the, the noise of the pump does not travel down the shaft and get into the recording studio. And that's a, a real problem. I don't know what you've got in your room to keep you cool or to keep the air circulating. Yeah, I, I'm working with a mini split, so I have to kind of turn it off when I'm doing critical recording. But it's, I mean, it's on right now and it's relatively quiet. But you know, I've heard figures like if you have a hole in the wall that's two or three percent in size, it lets in over 90 some percent of the sound. So it really yeah, doesn't yeah. take much for sound to find its way around sound is a monster yeah. it i mean if, if you have a keyhole, <laughs> really is. you know it, it, in professional recording studio you literally couldn't have a keyhole um they have to be their their room within a room they have one room mm -hmm. suspended on rubber within They're another floating. room yeah. it's all air brakes and so forth um so noise is the second thing and again that's not paid attention to I and mean, i'm glad to see that these days in, in domestic uh, appliances, you very often see decibel ratings stuck on the front of your fridge or your um, washing machine or uh, your dishwasher or whatever it might be, which is great. And if we can get those things down to 40 decibels or less at one meter, uh, that's going to improve the quality of our life. But lots of them aren't. And when you go to big commercial places like shopping malls or restaurants or whatever it may be, oh my goodness, you know, you've got stuff in there that nobody cares about how noisy it is, HVAC can be chucking out 60 decibels or have broken fans and making hideous noises, and people just ignore it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So yeah, noise, noise is the second thing. Um, the third thing is the sound system. Obviously, in a recording studio, you need monitor quality sound system. I'm sure you've got some lovely loudspeakers. Um, I've been in recording studios all over the world with amazing loudspeakers. In my room here, I just have a couple of little Genedex, which are very nice, very um, nice. good standard yeah. monitors from Finland. Um, and they're very flat, you know, they give me a very flat uh, response. Um, and there are plenty of those out there. But if you're in a proper recording studio, you have some big reference monitors as well, which are um, awe-inspiring speakers. Um, now, you know, in an office, in a schoolroom, in a hospital, you may not have speakers, or you may. And in a shopping mall, you often do, and we find so often that's the biggest mistake people make is they put in the lowest quality cheap loudspeakers they can get away with just for alarm Always. signals. Yeah. <laughs> and then some bright spark says, oh, you know what? We've got loudspeakers. Why don't we play music through that? That'll be nice. No, it is not. Because you walk around a shopping mall and all you can hear is... I don't even know what song this is. All I can hear is a <laughs> snare drum. This is really irritating. And that's what you get because the loudspeakers are incapable of delivering pretty much anything other than high, middle, distorted. Um, yeah, so speakers, loud sound system, that's the third thing, and making sure that that's appropriate. And then the fourth thing, of course, is content. Well, in the recording studio, you're making that, but in most rooms, you need to think about, do we want anything? Do we want background sound of any kind? Um, there's a knee-jerk reaction to play music now in so many public spaces, piped music. And um, that's being pushed a lot by the music industry because 
it's a big source of revenue to them now. You know, um, streaming has absolutely savaged the revenue they make from product. Uh, so they they make a lot out of live performance and they make a lot out of uh, public playing of music in back to shopping malls, airports, all sorts of places where we get music imposed on us. And actually, a lot of people don't like that. Um, mm. The music industry's got loads of evidence showing that we all love music everywhere, you know, in toilets, in uh, wherever it might be, car parks. Uh, well, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But I mean, I come back to the word appropriate again. I, I am a musician like you. I love music like you do, I'm sure. And um, I love to hear it, but not necessarily your music imposed on me. I may dislike that intensely. And a lot of people do. About a third of the people hate it, a third like it, and a third don't care. And well, I would a say, part of the problem is that the music that is played is often so banal. I mean, there's actually yeah. names for it, like Muzak. And uh, I, mean, I, mean, I would say most of the time, there's not much curation or thought into, is it very good music or even the, the what's happening inside the music and what that sort of, like you said, some of it can be sort of, sort of distasteful house music that you know someone pumped out in five minutes it's it's not much mm. of a song uh, there's not mm. much melody to there there's not much counterpoint or things that maybe or the rhythmic qualities that maybe make it more soothing or energizing and but i i wanted to ask you about uh noise in general because we're kind of talking about how music in a sense can sometimes become noise and what noise is in our lives and how it affects our physiology and our emotions and our body. There's someone that I quote a lot uh, named Gordon Hempton and he had a phrase about silence being the absence of noise, not the absence of sound. And I love that phrase because it makes me think about what it means to cultivate silence with that definition. Silence mm. being uh, when we do have sound around us, but it's a particular kind of sound. So like the sounds of nature perhaps is a form of silence that I enjoy, but it's quite nourishing and full of sound. Mm. Um, so Definitely. You, I've heard you talk a lot about this idea of noise. And also I'd like to hear a bit about like what that means to you. And, and what you know about what that can really do to us, uh, different kinds of noise that we are probably aren't aware of, but I'm sure we feel it. Noise and silence are two, two very important words. And um, noise, of course, is subjective. So your music might be my noise. My music might be your noise. There are sounds which most people agree they don't like. And that's a, you know, a, a reasonable definition of noise would be unwanted or disliked sound. Uh, so, you know, the sound of somebody vomiting, the sound of a baby crying, um, the sound of uh, a, a knife on glass or nails on a blackboard, those kind of grating sounds. Most people dislike hearing those. Uh, they, we get reactions to them, a ringing phone that nobody answers, you know. However, um, I think that Gordon Hempson definition is a very good one because I'm a big fan of silence to include gentle nature sound, biophilic sound. Mm. Um, I, I talk about wind, water, birds, WWB. My old friend Bernie Krauss, uh, who's a wonderful nature sound recordist, um, he divides noise or sound into three classes, which I think is really quite useful and interesting. There's biophony, which is the sound of nature, the sound of all the animals. And he talks about the great animal orchestra where, you know, there's a place and a time for all the sounds that are made and they they kind of create a symphony just like the instruments in an orchestra then there's geophony which is the sound of the planet so that's wind uh, water volcanoes thunder whatever it may be um and then there's anthropophony which is the sound of us and that's the problem really most of the time um electromechanical noise um just you know uncaring imposition of sound on other people which is often known as sod casting so <laughs> i think that's the thing to avoid i'm quite happy sitting in silence and we could talk for ages about different qualities of silence and how important silence is and what you meet in silence i'm also very happy sitting in quiet uh, which would be silence with say a bubbling a babbling brook next to me or the sound of rain in leaves or wind in grass or bird song, those kind of sounds. No, it's not silence, but it's, it's beautiful. And those sounds, incidentally, research is now showing are actually good for us. 
Uh, there's quite a lot of research now which is building up showing that, for example, birdsong aids recovery from a lot of different conditions like stroke and so forth, uh, and that running water is a very health-giving sound. In, and the, in, in fact, that's the sound we're basing uh, the Mood Sonic product on from the sound agency, which is sound that we've developed for offices to improve well-being and concentration. It's based on, uh, largely based on water, uh, off the research of Professor Hongistu in Finland, hmm. uh, who's found that water does a pretty good job masking. Uh, it takes out the consonants, the s and t. And if you remove consonants, it's very hard to understand speech. Vowels are not comprehensible on their own. Uh, so it's good at doing that. At the same time, there are lots of associations. And that's another really important word with sound, isn't it? Associations. Um, so we associate water with health, with purity, with life. We are 70% water anyway. Uh, so it's a pretty important sound for life um, and a very good one. So, yeah, um, so noise is at one end there, of the spectrum. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of really horrible noise that comes from biophony. I mean, I don't like the cawing of crows or, you know, there are animals which make unpleasant sounds. And certainly there are times when you think, will you just shut up, you know, um, mm. whatever it might be. Um, nevertheless, I think the vast bulk of biophony and geophony is to be enjoyed, to be relished and to be engaged with. Not so true of anthropophony. Um, I had heard that uh, two things I want to ask you about. Have you heard about, I don't know what these rooms are called, but there, you've seen these rooms that have absolute silence, uh, it's, which is actually quite almost totally unusual, where maybe the only thing you could hear is your own breathing and a heartbeat. And that supposedly uh, sort of folklore that this is extremely stressful for a typical human being, that they, it's almost like we, we need yeah. a kind of sound around us. And then I would imagine like the water... The associations, it's, it's sort of epigenetic in a way. It's, it's encoded into our, our history of what has been around us for millennia. And there's a certain soothing aspect to that. I, I had always heard that sounds of crickets and frogs, the things that are a, a large chorus of insects or animals that create this chaos of sound, but inside that chaos are these, these waves of order. And it's a form of white noise that can entrain the brain and some indigenous cultures have used them. They, they call them things like portal openers and so forth. Because when you meditate on a sea of frogs in a way, it, it starts to get you into a trance state. Mm. And so we've kind of used um, these things in the past, what's that which has been around us all the time. And that's how I got into doing field recordings initially, because there was it was kind of unlocking something for me um, emotionally. And I found that when I recorded it, it captured something of that feeling. It, it maintained mm. it just from the sound and putting that to music. I often said it felt like cheating in a way because it really brought the soul of a place. So, so, so instantly just by adding it in, it added a depth to the music, like, truly like a musical instrument, you know, cricket is sort of like a mm. tambourine of sorts, the frequency it's in, but it's, it's mm. a, such a organic, interesting sound that it's bringing in as opposed to something digital and sterile. And uh, I would imagine these these nature sounds, they really they really do. I mean, they're they're in our bones in a way. Do you think that's so? Mm. Yeah, they've been around a lot longer than we have. That's for sure. I mean, the planet's four and a half billion years old, and it's been making sound ever since it was formed, or <laughs> at least ever since it had an atmosphere. Um, and of course, many animals are experiencing sound more profoundly than we do because they live in water, which conducts sound far better than air does, twice as fast and much further, which is why whales can communicate over, you know, hundreds of miles if we let them, although we're deafening them all now with the sound of our shipping, sadly, so they're unable to do that these days. Um, so, yes, I think the sound of birds in particular, uh, I believe, is calming for most people, reassuring, because we've learned over hundreds of thousands of years that we've been around, or 200, 300,000 years, whatever it is, that when the birds are singing happily, normally things are fine. You know, it's pretty safe. So birdsong tends to make people feel secure. It's also nature's alarm clock when the birds start singing. You know, anybody who's been to an all-nighter knows that terrible moment when the birds start singing and everybody goes, <laughs> oh, I should be at home. <laughs> and um, that's because there's a signal there to tell you it's time to wake up. You know, if you're a farmer or you, or you lived on the land, that was the time to get up and start working, daylight. So it's 
uh, a sound tends to promote mental alertness and emotional security, which is quite a good state to be in if you want to concentrate or do something positive. Um, water in the same way, as I said, I think is associated with health and so forth. You know, lots of hot countries, you'll have people who've got houses with fountains or public fountains, and that's not so much there to look at, it's there to make the sound, because in those hot places, water is life. So the sound of water is reassuring, and it's pure, and it's life, and it's also wealth if you can afford to be wasting water like that. You know, it's symbolic of many things. So I think with all sound, association and imagery, what we make the sound mean, and which is after all what listening is, is making meaning out of sound, uh, it's so important. Uh, a sound can be one thing to one person and a completely different thing to somebody else. Right. And, and all these sounds you're talking about that are around us all the time that maybe are sort of causing a stress response in our body. I mean, what are things that maybe you recommend that people can do that they can control, like in their own home or ways of interacting with the world uh, to, to sort of lower a uh, stress response they might not even really know is happening? Well, the most important thing, which I'm sure you do and many musicians do automatically, is to listen consciously. I think musicians have an easier time of this because if you're playing in a band or an orchestra, you have to. You have to listen to everything. It's a multi-track listening. You have to be aware of all the instruments, all the other players. Otherwise, you're not doing a very good job, are you? You're off on your own. So developing that habit of multi-track, attentive, conscious listening is really important. And um, even people who don't play an instrument and never have can develop that just with a bit of practice. And it's so worthwhile because the moment you start listening consciously, you can take responsibility for the sound you consume. And indeed, of course, from the sound you make, which is equally important. But let's focus on the sound we're consuming. There's a lot of sound that's not good for us. You know, noise is not good for you, apart from damaging your hearing, um, which, you know, sadly, millions of kids are doing every day at the moment with headphones um, delivering 100 decibels deep into their ear canals for hours a day. I mean, that is killing their hearing. And we are, we're basically probably raising a, a whole generation of deaf people or potentially deaf people. Um, so noise can damage your hearing. Noise can also damage so much of you. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. that just in terms of stress levels, cortisol, adrenaline, sudden sounds, unpleasant sounds, imposing or overwhelming or intimidating sounds, or just any sound that you don't like. I mean, I mentioned a ringing phone earlier. That's one of the most stress-inducing sounds. You know, we're all familiar with that. Will somebody answer that phone? Because that yeah. is a call to action. And if it's not acted upon, it's as stressful as sitting next to somebody in a, in a plane on an eight-hour flight who's got a screaming child. You know, you want to do something. You, oh, God, can we stop this? But you can't. And that is a massive stress reaction, which creates all sorts of hormones in your body, which are not good for you for long term. You know, being, being overdosed on cortisol is not good for us. It creates all sorts of physical ailments. Right. And so, you know, I think the, apart from that, uh, you know, the noise of urban living is intense and, the numbers are terrifying. I mean, it's something like 3% of Europe's population is suffering sleep withdrawal or sleep problems because of noise at night outside their window from motorways or from uh, construction sites or whatever it might be. Probably not that so much at night, but definitely traffic noise and airplane noise. Um, it's wrecking sleep. And that that's 8 million people who can't sleep at night in Europe. Uh, you think of the cost of that to the health uh, providers who've got to deal with people who are stressed or depressed or uh, have fights or have accidents or whatever it may be uh, as a result of sleep deprivations. That's the biggest mechanism that um, allows noise to have a terrible effect on us all. And sadly, you know, we're, because most people don't listen consciously, we, we tend to ignore it. I mean, I, I often when I used to live in London, I'd go to Waterloo Station and there's a platform there in the Bakerloo line, which is curved. As the tube train comes in, the wheels make the most hideous uh, screech yeah, as they're, yeah. they're dragged around this curve in, in the track. It's a piercing shriek. I would, I've measured it. I mean, it's about 125 decibels. Good God. And 
Yeah, I put my fingers on my ears immediately and look around in astonishment as everybody on the platform is just standing there as if this is perfectly normal and acceptable. And it really isn't, you know. You only have to put your fingers in your ears to stop it, and nobody does. They just carry on reading their book or staring at the ads or whatever it might be. So I really think listening consciously, uh, there's an exercise I talk about in in that TED Talk on conscious listening called Savoring, which uh, is all about this, really. It's unlocking the hidden choir in sounds or or the hidden menace, if you like. It's becoming, oh, great. it's tasting sound, just like you taste food. You know, You know when food is bad for you, spit it out. But we are so numbed to noise because it's all around us, because we don't pay attention to it, because we're paying attention to a screen, we're tapping away, we're doing something else. Um, You know, life has got more and more intense. There are lots of reasons why we're not listening so much. And unfortunately, that means that we are assailed with sounds that are really bad for us. And they have, and they do have every day, a massive and really, really deleterious effect on health, on productivity, on happiness as well. That's a profound statement that I think, I mean, think we, we all know about when we can smell noxious smells. Um, we No one really thinks about sound and it is so ubiquitous in our lives. Not only that, if we go back just, just to the music thing we were talking about, how that's played in all over the place. Music is is more prevalent on this planet right now than it ever has been in the history of humanity. I mean, just on the streaming platforms alone, there's so many more people coming online, using them and growing their audiences. And we're listening more and more and more. And it's being played all over the place. It's It's like asking a fish what water is. And I really don't think we give it credence to the role it plays and just sound alone. I mean, the fact that obviously that we talk to one another, but it's, it's even encoded in, in things in our religions, you know, like, uh, God spoke and then Mm. the universe began or Mm. in science, the big bang, it's a sound. It's like, even it's this idea that there was this kind of resonance that started it all. And we're all, we're all in this reverberation, Mm. which is more like metaphysical philosophical way of looking at it. But, I, I kind of see us sort of acknowledging what it is, but we don't actually consciously recognize what, what's going on in our lives. And I really love this idea of conscious listening because I talk all the time about, I, I, I just call it um, active listening versus mm-hmm. passive listening. And when we're doing some of my ceremony concerts, that's really the, the exercise I'm bringing into it. It's like, how do we listen actively as uh, a mechanism of concentration. And then we just notice what that does, Mm. you know? And then inside that, we have a particular kind of soothing music that's helping kind of direct you inside. Mm. And when when you're talking about listening as a doorway to understanding, I think initially I would think, well, yes, that's about understanding others and a way of connecting with the world and those around me. But I, I heard that statement, and I also thought about listening as a doorway to understanding myself and my yeah. inner life, my yeah, own yourself, psychology. Yourself, your body, and the universe in which you live, absolutely. Because there's sound all around. I know in space there's no sound because there's a vacuum. But nevertheless, actually, the planets that have got atmospheres are all making sound. There's plenty of sound on it throughout the solar system. There's plenty of sound in the universe where there's gas uh, or some medium to carry it. And you're right. I mean, most creation myths have the the universe being spoken or sung into existence. It's quite interesting, you know. It's amazing. Um, yeah. Before there was light, uh, and the Christian creation myth is is just one of those. You know, let there be light came when he was speaking. <laughs> so there was sound mm-hmm. first. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, if you look at the physics of the Big Bang, it's quite interesting. For the first three hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. There was no light because photons were all bundled. They were bundled and not moving around. They were in a superheated plasma. But there was plenty of sound in that because a plasma is a kind of, it's it's a medium. Um, and indeed, sound could be uh, equated with the gravitational fluxes, which caused that if that plasma had been entirely uniform, we wouldn't be here. Uh, but because it was not uniform and there were ripples in it, sound, sound waves, if you like, waves, yeah. mm-hmm. they actually created the universe and the, um, you know, the cosmic background radiation that we can um, hear sometimes if we pay attention to it or, and use suitable instruments is the echo of that creation, which was sound first, 
and light afterwards. The photons wow. eventually got unbundled and then suddenly you could see and there was stuff that uh, you could look at. Um, so, you know, the myths are true to that degree, which is unsurprising to me and probably to you, but <laughs> maybe surprising to a lot of people. Um, so, yes, I think sound is, it, it, it's probably the most underrated um, thing of power around us. It, it's enormously powerful. It, it changes our bodies, our physiology, heart rate, breathing, hormone secretions, brain waves, uh, everything, you know, brain chemistry, the whole works gets changed all the time by sound around us. You only have to think of how your body reacts to a sudden sound behind you. There's nothing you can do about it. It's precortical. It's a very, very old brain. And you react faster to sound than you do to sight. And you can hear behind you, which is why it's your primary warning sense. So it's physiologically hardwired. Hmm. Then emotionally, psychologically, sound changes us all the time. You know, it might be that, you know, the, the sound of a person you love's voice, your grandmother's voice or something recorded would create an emotional reaction or a sound that you've got an association with, gentle rain or some sound, a piece of music, whatever it may be. These these can really bring emotional impact. Um, then cognitively sound changes how well we can think and you only have to go back to, we were talking about open plan offices, I mean, we can't think when there's somebody talking. We're programmed to decode language. It's complex. And we have bandwidth for about 1.6 human conversations, not two. You can't understand two people talking at the same time. Um, although I think, you know, there's a change in the way people are doing this with music these days. Um, and we can talk about this in a minute, many, maybe um, the changing relationship with music. Because I can't read a book and listen to music. That's not me possible neither. for me. Yeah. But I see people on tubes or buses reading a book with headphones on, and I think, how do you do that? I don't or understand. Or studying, yeah, or yeah. sleeping. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So that's the third way sound affects us is cognitively. It changes how well we can think, how densely we can think. And then the fourth way sound affects us, um, of course, is behaviorally. It, it changes what we do. There's loads of studies showing that fast-paced sound, fast-paced music usually, speeds people up. You walk faster, you move faster, which is why, again, so many shops do this wrong. They have fast-paced music. It makes people leave faster. What you actually want in a shop if you're, unless you're, you know, wanting people to be energized and there's a, it's a fashion shop and there's a particular uh, linkage there, there's some reason, you want slow music because you want people to stay longer and be calm and, you know, enjoy themselves, not, not be rushing about and leave. So those are the four ways sound affects us. It is so powerful. And being conscious to me is, is realizing that when you're listening, you're doing something. It's not hearing. Hearing is like your heart beating or breathing. It's a reflex. It happens. You hear everything to the extent you've got good hearing. Listening is a skill. It's an activity. It's something we can get better at. And to me, it's shocking that we don't teach it in schools. You know, it's such an important part of being a human being, and yet it's taken for granted. You know, we teach reading and writing, and it's a shocking scandal if a child leaves school unable to read. But millions of children right. leave school unable to listen every it year. It might save a few marriages as well. Oh, my goodness, yes. What's the most <laughs> common complaint in relationships? He or she never listens to me. They don't hear them, yes. They don't, they don't understand. They don't, they're not, yes, transmitting with their meaning of what they're trying to, to say or convey emotionally. Absolutely, because we're mm -hmm. doing two things when we listen. First, we're selecting something to pay attention to. You hear everything, you select certain things to listen to. So you don't listen to everything. And that is one reason why everybody's listening is different because different people pay, different thing, uh, pay attention to different things. Second, once you've decided what you're gonna pay attention to, you make it mean something. You decode it, whether it's language or a sound that you've heard before or a sound that's a bit like something you've heard before, or it's a sound you've never heard before, in which case it's a possible threat and you'll react like that. So it's selection and meaning making, which is why my definition of sound generally is making meaning from sound. Uh, sorry, my definition of listening is making meaning from sound. Well, so I love that listening has that element of choice. Yeah. 
totally. it's really important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's elective. It's a conscious activity. It's not a reflex passive action. I know it's a passive sense in the sense that your ears are not sending out in the way that perhaps you could see your eyes sending out, but they don't. I mean, they, they but they also receive your mouth certainly sends out. Nevertheless, sound is a very intimate Oh, hearing is a very intimate sense. You know, sound waves are coming inside you, is touching you inside your head. That's quite intimate. And we can't turn it off. It's always on. You have no earlids, so you have no choice. Um, if there's a sudden sound at night, you'll wake up. Um, your sound is always working. It's the first thing you gain in the womb. It's, by many accounts, the last thing that goes and fades when you die. So it's a massive sense, and yet... The listening part of it, which is where we're actually in relationship, we're in this dance with hearing. You know, we we have a role to play here. Our soul, our spirit, our mind is active in this. And to me, it's tragic that many people just have that turned off. They they haven't got that connection at all. So they happen to hear things and it's, it's purely accidental what they pay attention to and indeed what they make it mean. They're not conscious they have a choice there. Because I can make it anything mean anything, can't I? Which means I can actually change my reality by changing the way I listen. And that is quite an exciting concept. Yes, it is. It, I mean, when you talk, do you ever like lead sort of listening meditations or do you actually like walking someone through how to, what kind of tools to use in their own mind to do a form of active listening or conscious listening? I haven't really got into that um, area of listening, listening meditations. I mean, I know listening is very important, for example, in every spiritual path that I know of. Listening is right at the core. You know, you need to to be quiet and to listen to the voice of a deity or to your inner voice or whatever it may be. And these are quite quiet a lot of the time. So it's important not to be stomping about making lots of noise and, uh, you know, having dozens of thoughts. And, you know, many, many meditative paths paths are all about trying to find the gaps between the thoughts and just be there and listen. So that's very, it is a very spiritual thing to do. Um, I have had meditation practices in my life. I haven't got one at the moment, but um, I kind of think that a lot of the days I walk around in a a sort of walking meditation because I'm engaged in conscious listening and it's a very passive way to be you know it's um listening i think is a great gift if you're really listening to somebody that is giving them a hundred percent of your attention it is meditative because you still Mm -hmm. yourself you stop the little voice uh, inside you stop the you know what i'm going to say next i've got this great thing i want to say next will you shut up so i can say this great thing you know none of that is going on you're simply listening and trusting that what will come out of your mouth afterwards will be the right thing. And that is, that's a beautiful place to get to. It is a very centered, meditative place to be. Um, And it's not somewhere that many people are in conversation because so many people are obsessed with looking good or being right. Those two things in particular, which are damaging our society enormously, I think. Well, that is something to cultivate is how we give our attention. Our attention is 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 something that every company is vying for and it's a form of currency that you know, how much of it they can garner is it shows how successful they are and it just goes to show us like that's sort of a, a sacred human ability for us to choose what we put it on and as you're saying when you give your full attention to someone um so i just did a record with ramdas and he's this we I think you and I talked about him before before mm. we did this podcast, and that that was what he really gave what you, when you were with him in person was this unbelievable amount of presence and attention with just mm. you, and there was nothing there behind it. He was just sort of saying, "I'm just here receiving whatever you wish to say or give or not say," and and often we didn't say we would just be there and look at each other, and it was just sort of this lovely purity of attention, mm. and a lot of times, as you're saying, that has to do with in a sense, like how much noise is there present in that, in that attention? So with Ram Dass, there was none. In a sense, we weren't even saying anything. So we just took out all the variables. But with, with normal conversation, it's sort of, as you said, getting rid of the fluff and uh, not thinking about what sound and noise am I going to do next, or the noise in my own head, the sound that's reverberating, in a sense, silently in my synapses, in my brain. And it, it really can be a doorway to presence. 
thinking about, you know, how can I listen better, not just to other people, uh, but to myself and then to the sounds around me. Um, It's, it's a really deep subject that you're really, that you're bringing up that I think for some people they they can hear what we're saying and they get it and they understand it. And they're probably thinking like, well, how do I do that if I'm not a musician or how do, you know, what's my doorway in for the average Joe in a sense? Yes. Um, And um, I would just, before I give you maybe some exercises, which I've, I've given to people over the years, which help uh, to open that door. um, I think the enemy in all of this is fear and fear tends to manifest itself in the two really addictive habits that I've just mentioned, looking good and being right. And those are so prevalent in modern society now, apart from also uh, being distracted, you know, having something going on all the time, maybe two or three things going on, you know, a TV, a a phone, a tablet, uh, music, a conversation, multi-stream, this kind of thing, it's it's getting to the stage where we are uh, we're addicted to intensity, and that tends to really be um, displacing of intimacy and of listening, big time. I mean, listening and intimate intimacy are very closely related, I think. So uh, it all comes from fear: fear of not being liked, fear of being wrong, fear of being thought badly of, fear of being inadequate, whatever it may be. It's natural to fear as a human being. We all fear. Um, but unfortunately, it's coming out now um, because society is making it less and less acceptable to be wrong or ugly or, you know, not brilliant. Um, it It is becoming a big problem. And the easiest way for me to be right and feel good about myself is to make somebody else wrong. So that's at the root of a lot of the polemic and polarization and shouting that we're seeing in politics and unfortunately also in personal relationships. I think um, politicians go off and have talks. I wish they'd go off and have listens. It would be a better mm. world. Yeah. So how do you get, how do you, how do you open the door? Well, I mean, meditation is a very good practice and I do recommend it to anybody because it's a quietening of the spirit and a quietening of the voice in the head. Um, I, I gave some exercises in my TED talk on conscious listening um which if anybody wants if you go to juliantreasure.com and put your email address in we'll email them one after the other there's five little videos of me talking about these but i'll i'll mention a couple of them now um we talked about silence and i think acquainting yourself with silence reacquainting yourself with silence establishing a relationship with silence is a really good practice two or three times a day ideally even if you can't do that once a day. Go on, you can do that three minutes. And I am talking about silence in the sense that Krishna and uh, I mentioned earlier, which is relative quiet, just absence of noise, uh, not anything unpleasant. You can certainly have a beautiful natural sound around you. Um, if you're in your home, and you just go to the quietest place. You know, you might have to lock yourself in a bathroom or a cupboard or something, just three minutes. And it recalibrates your ears. Any musician who records knows that you have to take breaks every hour or so. Mm -hmm. Otherwise your ears go dead and you can't hear what you're doing. So it's about that refreshing your hearing, re-engaging your listening up to, and giving yourself a baseline. I mean, silence is the baseline for sound. And uh, it's very important to explore that. And you might meet yourself there. That's often what people fear, I guess, about silence. So it's a good practice. Yeah, it probably cultivates the ability then when you're just out and about and listening to someone to sort of like recognize what, what that silence is for you as sort of a barometer, a baseline. You know, am I there and am I really listening right now to what's around me and where am I putting my attention? Um, and hopefully that leads to not just a, a more well life, but maybe one that has less cortisol response, less stress. Mm. Uh, more recognition of the sounds going on around you. I know for myself, when I'm in a place where the sound is challenging for me, I kind of physically have to leave the space. It's, yeah. it's really hard for me to be there yeah. uh, in any situation. Yeah, I'm a lot older than you, and I get that with the cocktail effect in rooms with a lot of people talking. I find it really, really difficult now. And um, I mean, that's known to get worse as you get older. Nevertheless, I'm more and more sensitive to sound. I mean, I haven't got hyperacusis or anything yet. I sort of dread that. Um, but I am certainly getting to the stage where even you know my five-year-old daughter um, can 
hurt me with sound if she chooses to. <laughs> uh, and I, I have to explain it to her, which I try to do in a very calm way. Daddy's got very sensitive ears. Um, so, yes, I agree with you completely there. And I think it's if you're going to be responsible to your hearing, to your health, then it's really important to reestablish the baseline and understand the range of sound so that when you go into a, a restaurant, which is 95 decibels, and you you find yourself bellowing, you, you can say, you know what, I really don't want to be in here. I'm going to leave. And you can have a word as you go out and just say, I won't be back. Uh, lovely food, but it's too noisy. Um, they don't get much feedback like that, unfortunately. So things don't change very often uh, because people are not conscious of the fact that they've just left with a sore throat and a sore head and, um, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't a nice experience. But they'll probably go back <laughs> because they don't associate the, the noise with the, the ailments. So, yes, yeah, silence is the first exercise I'd recommend. We talked about savouring, which is a really good practice. And, I, I mean, I would say to anybody listening to this, go around your house with your eyes shut. I mean, you might have somebody help you or you might go into a room, then shut your eyes and listen really carefully to each room and just ask yourself, is there anything in here I should remove, which is not useful or pleasant? Is there anything I could put in here which would be enhancing it and making it more pleasant and more functional for whatever it is you want to do? So it might be, you know, the sound of gentle surf at night when you want to sleep, which is a very soporific and lovely sound. Or it might be uh, the sound of birdsong in the morning in certain rooms. Uh, or it might be turning that ice machine. I mean, I'm the person in American hotels who goes out into the corridor and unplugs the ice machine, I'm afraid. <laughs> I love that. So, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Listening to those things, I mean, I've, I've had to move rooms in hotels many, many times because of the air conditioning or the, the, the fridge that you can't get at the plug. It's behind a big unit. And yeah, I always going unplug the fridge. Yeah. <laughs> all night. Hideous. So, um, yes, that's savouring. Uh, but the other one I think I'd, I'd love to mention is listening positions because it really is getting into a conscious engagement with where you're listening from. You're listening from somewhere all the time. It's not a physical position I'm talking about, it's sort of spiritual. Um, and give you a couple of examples. I mean, these are, these are there because we listen through all these filters that we talked about, you know, values, attitudes, beliefs, emotions, intentions, expectations, assumptions, uh, the language you speak, the culture you're born into, all these things create your listening and it can ossify in most people it has ossified and it's rigid so you tend to listen in one way all the time from one place if you like and it's a bit like being in a concrete bunker and looking at the world through the little slit in the front of it not knowing there's a door in the back of the bunker you can come outside and walk around and get completely different experiences so that's a wonderful way to think about it and so an example would be critical listening, which is a listening position that many people adopt at work, for example. It's where you're assessing, evaluating, um, you're, you're, is this useful? Is this good? Do I agree with it? You know, what am I going to take from this? Where's this going? All that kind of uh, assessment is critical listening, and it's very useful at work. However, people get stuck in that, and it might not be the best way to be at home, for example when you might want to move more into empathic listening, which is going on to the other person's island, feeling their feelings, uh, leaving them feeling not just heard, but understood as well. And that's a wonderful thing to give to somebody, not what you want to be doing at work all the time, but moving consciously between those positions is enormously powerful. There are many, many, many listening positions. I mean, people listening to this, you can create your own ones, there are as many as you want to create. And it's a question simply of asking, where would be the best place for me to listen from in this conversation with this person, as opposed to that conversation with that person? So that, I think, gives you access to flexibility, changing your listening. You're totally in control of what you select to listen to and what you make it mean. And most of us have lot, let go of that. We've lost our connection with that ability to listen consciously and from different places. So those are a couple of accesses to conscious listening. 
Um, I think being curious is a great one. I mean, being ferociously curious all the time. That's a really good way to listen. And being committed. I mean, one simple thing I'd, I'd, I'd urge anybody listening to this to do after mm -hmm. this, after you've listened to this, next time you have a conversation with somebody you love, put everything down, look at them, pay attention to them, and listen to them 100%. And they'll probably go, what are you doing? <laughs> because they haven't experienced that for a long time. We spend most of our lives doing something else and doing a bit of listening on the side. And it's a wonderful gift, as I said earlier. I think there are billions of people on this planet who've never had that experience of being fully listened to by somebody who's absolutely looking at them and doing nothing else. Scott Peck, who wrote The Road Less Travelled, which is a wonderful book, said, it is not possible to listen to another human being and do anything else at the same time, to truly listen to another human being. And I agree with that completely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a great gift. And that would be a great thing to go off and do after listening to this podcast. Yeah, fully witnessing another human is maybe what we're here to do. And I think a lot of problems could be solved by just hearing other people. You, could, you can look at that even geopolitically, like we get into all this sort of saber rattling. And if we ever, I don't even know how it would be possible, but just for countries to sort of whoever's heading this up is like, can we just, can we just hear each other? You know, and it makes me think of, there was some form of uh, tribunals or trials they sort of had. And I only know the cliff notes of this uh, in South Africa. Yeah. And the it truth basically gave, yes, well, you, and it had something to do with really hearing from the people who had been hurt by the people who had done the genocide or the murders. And that was more effective and more powerful than, say, hanging them, you know, or just, you know, pilloring. But it was, it was both ways as well. It was the people who had every right to bear a grudge, hearing from the people who had perpetrated mm -hmm. and understanding them too. So it was a two-way street. Um, mm -hmm. And that's really important. Um, Barack Obama said, I like to listen to people, especially when I disagree with them, which is a pretty rare trait. Not many mm -hmm. people are like that. You know, we go out seeking reaffirmation that we're right. So the internet, you know, we don't browse, we go out looking for people who agree with us. And that's why we're getting this increasing polarization all the time. And I think it's a wonderful thing to listen to people to whom, you know, we have every right not to listen uh, and whom we have every right to caricature and despise. It's, it's a great thing to attempt to listen and understand, I don't agree with you. What you did was terrible. I can understand how you got there even if only to make sure that we don't let any other be people go down that road and do those things. Uh, you know, human history is littered with atrocities, unfortunately, and it's, it's, you know, that's a door that can be gone through over and over again by humanity. So I think it's very important to understand that as well in order to make sure it doesn't happen. Right. It's, it's, I mean, we're just, our path is filled with traumas and listening seems to be one of the main paths to work your way through it and to move beyond it. Even when you think about the analogy that all sound hits something and reverberates off it, it's sort of bouncing around. And so you, in a sense, you always have to be listening for the response. Mm. You know, a wave reverses directions and it's, it's constantly like moving around a room and it's the same thing. There's an energy to that or it's, it's, it's an apt analogy for you know, what we're, we're supposed to do with sound and what our role in it is. And that is, as you're saying, just to, just to listen and to really, what it really means to really receive. And we're listening in a sense as a form of receiving by turning your attention to it. So it's a really beautiful way to look at how to walk your life. I love it. Good. Yes. Well, <laughs> I think it's really important. You know, life is vibration. Sound is vibration. Uh, we are vibrating all the time. Um, so at a very deep level, uh, the, these are, you know, these are really fundamental things. Lack of vibration, stillness is death. I mean, there is, there is nothing where there's no vibration. So, you know, what we're talking about really is embracing that. It's not ignoring it, uh, being numb to it, um, or getting distracted away from it. It's, it's turning towards it, embracing it fully and being sensitive to it. Uh, that is a much deeper 
and more productive way to live, I think. And sound is the most obvious form of vibration for us. Um, I know light's vibration too, but um, nevertheless, I think sound is ignored massively. And um, we are going to see that change in the coming years now with, you know, there's an audio revolution coming on the internet. We'll be go we're going to be speaking to the internet, not tapping with our fingers and looking at screens so much. Uh, there are billions being invested in speech recognition and voice synthesis and so forth. Uh, smart speakers are just the first step on that road. So I think sound is going to make a comeback. Um, but will that be noise? Well, that remains to be seen. And uh, I think we all need to start listening. Otherwise, we're going to get a world that's just noisier and noisier and noisier. Well, that seems like a great place to find closure. If I know there's this, there's a lot of depth to, in all the talks you've given, and you've got some books. And what's a great way for people to interface with you and go deeper? Well, the, my book is How to Be Heard, and that's available in all the usual places. Um, and there's an audiobook version of that, which I, I did myself, which won two awards, actually. I was very proud of that. It won both the awards for Best Business Audiobook last year. So that's available. Um, and I would recommend consuming it in sound, of course, being a sound person. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, then um, just pop by my website, actually, also, and, you know, sign in and get those five little listening exercises. Uh, that's worth doing. Um, I think they may be useful. It's two of them I've given here, and there are three more. And they are good accesses to conscious listening. So, yes, I hope those things are of use to people. There are the TED Talks as well. There's five of those eight TEDx talks, I think, if you wow. Google away or, you know, your search engine of choice. Um, so there's plenty of stuff out there. And most mostly it's, you know, it's not about um, slavishly following what I say or any, anything else. It's about just saying to yourself, you know what, I'm going to listen and taking that on. It's, there's no university syllabus in this. There's no recognized way to do it. You simply need to commit to be conscious in your listening and work at it every day and listen, listen, listen. And my goodness, your life will change for the better. Well, thank you, Julian, for giving us your time. I've had a joy sitting here on headphones listening to you. I like that we actually can't see each other because I can really just listen. Yeah. And it's been, I just really appreciate uh, getting a chance to connect. Well, thank you, Krishna, for the opportunity. It's been a joy and uh, I look forward to many conversations in the future with you. Thanks. Cheers. Well, I can't thank Julian enough again for giving us his time. I thoroughly enjoyed uh, talking to him, and I'm hoping we get to do it again sometime. Definitely check out his world and his work. Um, it's a deep dive, and his TED Talks are entertaining and you know wonderfully in informative and amazing. Thank you, Julian. This music you're hearing in the background, this is the We Are Truth, the album leaf rework from the album that came out uh, at the very end of the year there, the East Forest Ramdoff Reworks album. Um, that this, is, this was the latest track that was released with this album and pretty exciting to have the album, album leaf involved along with everybody else, mostly because the album leaf is one of the the, the groups that I was the most inspired by way back when, when I was first starting East Forest as someone that is like, that's kind of the closest I could find to musically the world I was putting my foot into, the sort of electro-acoustic, chambery, somewhat, you know, emotional at times, but post-rocky, uh, occasional vocals. And anyway, so it's, it's really fun to kind of come full circle and have the album leaf uh, be gracious enough to do a rework for for East Forest and Ramdas. So if you haven't heard the Reworks album, it's everywhere that you listen to music. As with the rest of the East Forest catalog, there's 22 releases. So thank you for all your support and for listening, for coming out to the shows. And I'm looking forward to seeing my Australian brothers and sisters in February of 2020. You guys keep walking your walk. Don't take any shit, but if you do, you gotta do it with grace.
Yeah.